And there ain't going to be no more crying. There ain't going to be no more dying. There ain't going to be no more weeping. All those things will be done. Amen? Amen. We have something to shout about. We have something to be joyful for because we know that there is going to come a day in our life that everything we're dealing with now is never going to be again. No more crying, no more dying because one day our king is coming. Now we're going to sing our big exciting song soon and very soon. We're going to see the king. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's have fun this morning. Hallelujah, we're going to see the king. Here we go. going to be soon and very soon we're going to sing the sing that around the throne of heaven i like this old song i was uh, again just kind of reminiscing on some old stuff we're not going to sing a lot of new stuff today we're singing some old stuff but this old song i ran across the other day it said ring the bells of heaven amen we ought to be ringing the bells of heaven now you get excited about the opportunity we have to let somebody know that jesus christ is everything in their life sing this song with us ring the bells of heaven there is joy today amen how many of y'all know this song? Praise the Lord. Here it is.
Now you say, well, brother, that don't fit with all those other songs we sang. It really does. You know, when we begin to think about that none of this stuff's going to matter when we see him face to face, and then we understand that soon and very soon, none of the things that cause us heartache are going to matter, then spreading the gospel becomes the only thing that really does. I mean, if, if, we, if we know we're going to a time in our life there's going to be no more crying, then, then we have everything to rejoice about. Amen. If we know that we're going to a time in our life that there'll be no more dying because we see the King of kings and the Lord of lords, then the only thing that becomes, becomes a reality in our life is that the gospel can change anybody's life. So let's do our best to ring the bells of heaven. Now, some of y'all are like, I don't even know what that means. Here's what the Bible says. All of heaven rejoices when one soul comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we had a young lady come and walk the aisle and be saved. Guess what? We rang the bells of heaven. Amen. You never know what the effects that you can have on somebody's life. Maybe just that kind word spoken, that, that right testimony at the right time would cause somebody's belief in Christ to be strengthened and, and everything become right and real and they accept Christ as their personal Savior. Guess what? You just rang the bells of heaven. Amen. So out of all the things you could accomplish this coming week, why don't we choose to say, Lord, I, I'm not worried about my job. I'm not worried about the things that, that, that most people, this week, I want to ring the bells of heaven. I mean, I absolutely want to just ring the bells of heaven. Why? Because I am redeemed and I know I am. I know that none of this stuff matters and what an awesome opportunity it is that we have to tell the truth and let the truth be what it is in our life. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and begin our service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are wonderful to us. You are gracious and Lord, what a great opportunity we have as the people of God, Lord, to rejoice in what we have in the promises found in the Word of God. Lord, everybody in this room probably faced a, a time of, uh, of, of uh, adversity this week. Lord, we, we probably had some trying times, Lord, some, some things that went through our heart, went through our minds, some times of frustration, some times of anger, some times of doubt, or some times of worry, some times of fear. Lord, we faced those gauntlet of emotions that went through our week, and Lord, there were some situations I'm sure that everybody in this room went through, God, that, that we were looking to you. But Lord, in, in that moment of those fears and in those, that moment of that shadow that lurked about us, Lord, we, we, we should have just stopped and said, there's going to come a day when I see you face to face. Where none of those fears, none of those frustrations, none of those worries, those tears will be dry, those fears will be gone, the frustrations will be ended, the the anger, Lord, the, those emotions that we deal with, those things will be gone when we see the King of Kings. And Lord, because of that great truth, it ought to change who we are. Change how we act, change what our message is, change the way we talk and walk, and just really, as the Bible says, the whole conversation of our life ought to be tuned to a different station. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us today. Set aside those things that are not profitable for us. Lord, bind the hands of our enemy, Lord, and put a hedge of protection about us, Lord, that our, our thoughts might be trained upon you. Lord, that we might see the, the, the joys that lay ahead of us and not those things that um, caused us uh, worries and heartaches this past week. So, Lord, I pray that you uh, just intervene in a mighty way. Hide us behind the cross, empty of, of self, and fill us with your spirit. And we'll be careful to give you all praise and honor and glory. For it's Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Just to give you a few announcements this morning, I want to thank um, all those who took their teenagers out to um, Brother uh, Jack Tuttle's, um, I don't know what you call that thing, a clay pit, a sand pit, a, a quarry. We'll call it a quarry. And, uh, man, they had a blast. I got to go out there for just a little bit, and they... Uh, tried to uh, tried to put some uh, fear of God in me by putting me in a Jeep. What they just didn't realize is all they were doing is sparking childhood memories of <laughs> doing crazy stuff that I should not be doing. And and uh, and the crazy part about it, they, Brother Jack was taking me and going all these crazy ways. And we talked about everything in the world except for the fact that there were several times I thought we were going to topple over. And we would just be going, and I figured this. This is what I figured. He's the one driving. It's his rock quarry. It's his vehicle. 
it, it, he knows the limitations of it, so I wasn't going to worry. I was just talking about everything in life, and I was like, well, what kind of dirt is that? What do you do here? How, can you get clay from it? And we were just chatting like we were driving to Walmarts, and <laughs> half time we'd be like this, half time we'd be like this, we'd be like this, and all of And one point in there, he went through a, a real hairy spot, and I just kind of leaned to him, he, towards him. He goes, ha, 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 you know which way to lean. I was like, well, I wasn't going to lean out that way. <laughs> Get all this going that way with where we're already going. We're gone, buddy. And my thing is this. He ain't going to kill himself, so as close as I can get to him, I'm going to be all right. Amen. I don't care. I'm secure in my manhood, but I'm going to hug him if we go to rolling. Amen. Me and him going to be locked up, buddy. But the kids had an absolute blast. It was a fun time. Thank you for all your parents for letting them go. I thank you for all the kids that got involved and went there. It was a great, great time. Then the ladies' tea. Uh, I saw y'all had a great and wonderful time. Wore a bunch of crazy hats. Praise God y'all don't wear them to church. It would be hard to preach with all them hats on. Amen. <laughs> now, I've seen some of them pictures. Y'all had them big old things on. First of all, I would pray for the people sitting behind you because they wouldn't be able to see me. Amen. And, uh, but, uh, but it would look like a fun time. Thank you for all those who participated, all those who put in such a hard, uh, a hard effort to get it all uh, put together. Uh, the ladies had a, what I could tell a wonderful time, and thank you uh, for those. And then uh, just the uh, opportunities we have to um, be involved in different ministries this week. We do have a few things coming up uh, this week. Um, I want you to be much in prayer for the women's prayer ministry. Uh, there is an announcement in our bulletin. They're going to meet Monday, March 20th at 6 o'clock. I know the past couple of times they've had some uh, hang-ups with different ones being sick, but I'm glad everybody's on the mend. I'm glad everybody's doing well, and uh, so they're going to plan their next one. If you don't know what the women's prayer ministry is, it's a special prayer ministry in our church um, for the women that they gather together and pray for the needs of not only each other but also in our church. They reach out to uh, ladies' uh, shut-ins and those um, that might need extra prayer and just try to be an extension of the arm of our deacons for our church. And they do a wonderful, wonderful job, and I thank you uh, for all that. If you'd like to um, uh, participate, you can talk to Miss Mary Garrison. Miss Mary, wave at them. That's Miss Mary. If you'd like to participate in the women's prayer ministry, uh, see Miss Mary, and she would uh, be glad to give you more of the particulars. The baby shower is coming up. Uh, Miss Amy Smith um, going to be expecting number one. Amen. Amen. Dalton don't have a clue what he's in for, amen? <laughs> um, uh, and so that's going to be coming up April 1st uh, from 1 to 3. Um, and and uh, you can get more details uh, about that as we go get a little closer to it. The biggest thing we got coming up is our Easter Sunday. Uh, we call it Easter Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we're going to make a big celebration. I spoke with the deacons a few weeks ago, and we were just talking about ministry opportunities. And I told them one thing I'd like to stress this year is just to get our face out into the community. Let people know um, that um, we're here and we're here to help them and, and be a blessing to them. Uh, one thing we always do every year, and, and, it, and is, it is of great success, is our fall festival. Our fall festival, we have a wonderful time. We have a lot of people on campus, and we do a lot of big things, and it's always a great outreach for our church. Um, but I told him, I said, I'd like to take that opportunity of Resurrection Weekend and do the same thing. Be a, an outreach or have an outreach in our community, and, and let it be something that we can uh, reach new families and or uh, restore some families. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of events that whole weekend. Number one, we're going to start on Good Friday. Good Friday is that Friday of that weekend where uh, we are going to have a special communion service that evening on a Friday night. You say, what? We're going to church on a different night? Yeah, we're going to go to church on a different night. It's going to be all right, though. Don't worry about it. But what we're going to do is we're going to come at 6 o'clock and have a communion service here in the auditorium. Special singing, special reflection upon the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then follow, following that special service with a communion service where we actually take communion and we remember the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After that, we are going that night, we're going to go to the fellowship hall and have a dinner on the ground kind of situation. Uh, we're going to call it, uh, you know, a, a fellowship supper. We're not going to do a lot of the cooking, though. We're going to ask you to bring in a dish uh, and bring in some food. We're all going to share that, though, kind of one of those old school dinner on the grounds, you know, where everybody brought in something different. What I loved about those old school dinner on the grounds is every bra everybody brought some chicken, amen, some sort of chicken. You say, why? Because it was cheap and easy to cook, Amen. 
But I, I loved it because you would see the different boxes of chicken. Somebody had been gone, gone, done gone to Win Dixie, or somebody had been done gone to back there, and it was IGA. Well, IGA chicken was good, amen. But you had IGA chickens. Then somebody spurred and brought some KFC or something like that. You go, oh, the KFC would always go first. But we'd have those times when we would all collectively bring that, those uh, the the blessings of God in. And uh, that's what we're going to ask you to do. We're, we're going to ask you to just bring in um, some food. You can cook it. You can buy it. I don't care. But bring enough to feed you and your family and maybe one or two others. And we'll have a great time together uh, just fellowshipping, remembering what God has done for us by sending his precious son to die on the cross. That will be on that Friday uh, of that weekend. But then Saturday's the big day. Saturday is the day I'm going to ask for whole church involvement. I'm not talking about just Brother Rennie. I'm not talking about just the teenagers. I need all church involved, just like we do in Fall Festival. Here's what our vision is. We're going to take the, the framework of what we do in the Fall Festival, but we're going to do it around um, the Resurrection Weekend. We're going to call it Hallelujah Saturday. And we're going to start We're going to start it from 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to go to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we do have some sign-up sheets for everything I'm about to talk about, and we have some flyers that kind of give this itinerary as well. Well, but from 10 to 12, we're going to have a time just like our fall festival. We want you guys to do the same thing. Set up your cars with a game to pass out some candies to some kids. We want a carnival-style feel. Kids can come here, play a game, get a track, get a, a blessing from one of you. Here's an opportunity. You can out, uh, have an outreach to somebody in your community. Bring your vehicle. Have a game set up. It could be pin the tail on the donkey. It could be whatever you want to do. I don't know. Just think outside the box. I'm going to tell you, if you say, well, I don't know how to do that. There's this app that most women sit on for hours called Pinterest. I don't understand it. Don't like it. It's not for guys, okay? It's not for guys. It's not. It's for women. Because most men know Pinterest means, hey, honey, can we build this? What? And they hand them the phone. Well, that's, that's just evil right there. Whoever created that is plum evil. So because then next thing you know, we're out there scavenging every uh, pallet that we see behind every store trying to build a fence for a goat so it won't get out because somebody told us you can build a whole barn out of pallets, and we're all out there fighting over pallets, which we used to burn for a bonfire. Amen? I'm a little bit sore, but don't worry about it. I'll get over it. But go on Pinterest, find a game. Uh, set it up and have a good time. We want you to be involved with that. And so then we can pass out candy and do that. We're going to have some bounce houses. Well, there are six games that Brother Rennie has that he needs volunteers. You might um, be an individual say, well, I can't set up my car, but I can come help work another game, or I can come help set up the bounce house or uh, work the bounce house. Uh, we need volunteers in all areas. Again, there are sign-up sheets for you to get involved. Each one of those are lined out how you can get involved. If you want to work in a bounce house, I think that we need four volunteers to work bounce houses. I need uh, six people to work the games. Um, then those who can participate in a car game, uh, please let us know. We're going to do that for two hours. Then we're going to bring the kids inside and the parents and we're going to feed them. We're going to give them a hot dog, hamburger, let them do an arts and craft, give them a Bible lesson. And then, uh, and then at the end of the day, we'll go out and have a, a nice big egg hunt and just let kids uh, do the traditional uh, Easter egg hunt where they're out hunting the eggs. But we're trying to give the story of the resurrection uh, in that whole event. Ten to two, church-wide. Do not think for a moment, well, that's just for kids. That's for Brother Rennie. Nope, I'm asking you. Man, let's get involved. Let's have a big outreach. Let's tell, tell people about it, but let's get here and let's get busy. We need people here early to help set up. We need people here late to tear down. Then Sunday, we're going to have our Resurrection Sunday. We have a baby dedication already lined up. We have a baptism already lined up on that day. We have a lot of stuff on that Resurrection Sunday where we'll just be rejoicing in what God has done and what God is going to continue to do in our church. Amen? Amen. It's a big event coming up in April. Eat all hands on deck. Do not plan your vacation. Do not say, well, I would have been here, but I got this plan, and I'm going here. I, no, no, all those things are out. This is a church-wide event. Let's do it as a church. Let's, let's cooperate as a church. Let's build it as a church. And uh, I'm, our college kids, y'all coming home that weekend. Just plan it right on your calendar. Both of you, drive in, because I need both of you here that weekend. Amen? Teenagers, we don't have any ball games that weekend. Get here. Amen? No cow shows, no ball games, no nothing. We're here at church, amen? 
We're going to make it right. We're going to get out in the community, let everybody know what we can do. Uh, like I said, there's sign-up sheets. We need you involved. Right after church this morning, Brother Rennie is going to have a meeting on over some of this more. You're going to hear his vision. His vision is well, a little bit better than mine because he describes it as a carnival with all kind of crazy things going on. I pretty much say, let's get here and let's get to work. Amen. Uh, different vantage point, same thing. Amen. Amen. So let's plan for it. Let's put it on our calendar and let's get ready to make a big outreach to our church, our, to our community. Amen. 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 We're going to take up our regular Sunday morning offering, but we have a, a, a blessing this morning. Um, Brother Phil Wahab uh, from the Good News Camp, his daughter is going to sing uh, and sing a special for us during our offering this morning. And uh, we th we're thankful for what um, God is doing there at the Good News Camp. This week is their spring camp. Uh, he says they're they almost at their goal of having 40 kids uh, come. And you say, well, that don't sound like much. Great. Go there next week and you help take care of 40 kids. You'll find how much 40 kids really are, amen. But I'm thankful for the ministry continuing, thankful for Brother Phil and his family, what they're doing, man, just a phenomenal job. And uh, we're going to let them bless us a little bit this morning, let his daughter come and bless us with singing this morning. And so, uh, ushers, you come, and uh, who's praying this morning? Who's the deacon on the call? Brother Jim, right here behind me, sorry, sorry, sorry. Amen. So, we had a birthday party for Mr. Drew last uh, yesterday. Man, that was a great, great ceremony for Mr. Drew and Mr. Kim's dad. Um, I think Mr. Drew got a big surprise. Because <laughs> it wasn't his birthday, but we did it anyway, didn't we? Uh, guys, I want to uh, just tell you a little bit of what I've been learning in uh, training. And uh, the pastor hit on some of it last week about grace. Grace is a free gift. Think about that free gift. And the, and the scripture that goes with that is Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Amen. Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't earn it, and we sure don't deserve it. Amen. And the memory verse that goes with that is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, but the gift of God. Again, gift of God, not ourselves lest any men should boast. I give it praise and glory. Those memory verses, I've struggled with them, struggled with them. Guess what? I just threw them out there without a Bible, without no writing in front of me, so I'm proud of myself. <laughs> I'm not trying to boast, but it's starting to click, guys. It's starting to click. Anyway, I'm going to pray for the offering and turn it over to this young lady. She's got a beautiful voice. I've heard her sing uh, a little over a year ago. So, Our dear, blessed Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. The day we could come here and just learn about you thank you for sunday school thank you for church thank you for the preacher who blessed us through sunday school and now is going to give us the meat and taters for the the service today dear lord thank you for the singing thank you for all the people that showed up and just bless them one way or another to know that you are the chosen one to to just give us the free gift dear lord and just let everybody um, accept jesus christ and repent because we're such a simple people we just thank you for this offering, dear Lord. Let it bless this church and everything that uh, we have a hand in doing for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Scared. Oh, I thought I knew scared. But I'm so filled with fear. I can barely move Doubt I've had my share of doubt But never more than right now I'm wondering where are you Here on the edge of falling Somehow your promises find my troubled heart. This is the truth I'm standing on. Even when all my strength is gone, you are faithful forever. And I know you'll never let me fall. Right now I'm 
I'm choosing to believe. Someday soon I'll look back and see all the pain had a purpose. Your plan was perfect all along. This is the truth I'm standing on. Good. I believe you're still good. Even when life's not good, I will not lose this hope that the God who parts the seas promises he's gonna make a way for me. This is the truth I'm standing on. Even when all my strength is gone, you are faithful forever. And I know you'll never let me go. And uh, we had the opportunity to enjoy a lot of that. But what a blessing, amen. amen. Uh, we have another blessing. Uh, Miss uh, Judy was talking about the, or Brother Jim was talking about the surprise birthday party for um, Brother Borders and Brother Hopkins. And um, Miss Judy um, wanted to be a blessing to those family members that come in and offer the opportunity for Brother Drew to sing a special for you. Brother Drew sings very, very well. If you've been here for on, on Wednesday nights, man, he just belts it out, amen. amen. And so I, I thought it was a wonderful idea. So Brother Drew's going to come and uh, join his daughter. Brother Drew, you come and join Miss Judy as they're going to sing that old song, What a Day That'll Be When My Jesus I Shall See. Amen. Thank all of y'all who came to the birthday party yesterday. Daddy truly was the prize. I'd like for all of you to uh, just realize that all my family is here. Amen. I got uh, four of them here today, and I got one that's not here. But I'm proud of them. I love every one of them.
lungs and a lot of times my voice just gives out on me and I'm, I'm sorry. Good job, Amen. Bruce. You did pretty good. Stand with us. We're going to sing that song, My Chains Are Gone, Amazing Grace. You know, we have that promise of what a day that'll be because of what uh, Christ has done and the amazing grace that is offered to us. What a beautiful, beautiful moment that we could share with Brother Drew just saying, what a day that'll be. And we know that we all face hard times and difficult times, but it's because of that amazing grace of God that we have that beautiful truth to stand upon. That one of these days, we'll be in a different place, in a different, different world altogether, and we'll be completely free from pain, regret, sorrow, and all the other things that we lug around with. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this song together. My chains are gone.
Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I like how God kind of reminds you of His goodness right in the midst of all of our stuff we go through. You come to the house of the Lord and uh, just experience testimonies and blessings that God has given to us. And what a blessing it is uh, to be a, a part of an opportunity just to magnify Him on a daily basis. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm going to preach a little different this morning. Um, I'm going to pre preach out of the book of Revelation. And, and I'm actually going to preach two different chapters in the book of Revelation. And I know right off the bat, many of you are saying, Brother Aaron, we, we were here during your Revelation series, and that took you two years. I promise you, promise you you're not going to get all those notes. Amen. Um, I do enjoy... Um, eschatology. I, I, I enjoy Bible study. i just be honest with you. I mean, if you've been here on Wednesday night, it took us um, about two years to go through the book of Job. It took us about two years to go through uh, the book of Revelation. It took me about a year to do the tabernacle in the wilderness, and now we've been on a year or so of, uh, of uh, the book of Genesis. I love it. I think Bible study is something we ought to do. I think it's something we ought to get involved with, and and be a part of it, but I do like taking excerpts of the Word of God and just giving us good food for thought, and this morning is uh, one of those things I want to do, just take an excerpt out of a passage and um, uh, just expound upon it for just a little bit. We're going to begin in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4, and um, The Bible says, after this I looked, in verse 1, it says, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first verse, uh, voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Without a doubt in my mind, I believe that is talking about the rapture of the church, if we would take that and make that in a correlation of what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, that sounds very similar to a passage where it says that one of these days, that he, he would not have you be ignorant, brethren, that one of these days, that uh, with the shout of the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive uh, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be. It sounds just like what the Apostle Paul says one of these days in 1 Corinthians. He said one of these days will be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, uh, when the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We understand that there will come a time when the rapture takes place. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John, where John was shown a representation of what that revelation scene was all about and what's going to take place the day the rapture takes place. And that is, at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God, we will rise from this place, dropping this robe of flesh, to be changed from corruption into incorruptible, to be changed from mortal to immortal, as God gives us that new glorified body there in a preparation to be with him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We don't preach enough about the rapture. I don't, I'm not one of these fear-mongering kind of preachers. I'm not going to get up here and say, well, the rapture is going to happen tomorrow, and you, you better get your house in order. Friend, you ought to have your house in order if the rapture is happening tomorrow or not. You ought to just be ready for it, because we know not the day or the hour when the Son of Man come again. We don't know. It's, it, it's like one of those times when your mom and daddy got home before you was ready for them to get home because you didn't do everything your mom and daddy said you ought to have done. Amen. You ever had the fear of God reach into your soul because your mom and daddy said, I want these chores done. I'm going to run somewhere. I'm going to come back. And then you got to lollygagging, playing around, found in every stick that became a gun and every pine cone that became a bazooka as you tossed it at your brother in the yard. When you had all those moments, but then when you heard that vehicle pull in the driveway and the fear of God gripped your soul because you did not feed up like you were supposed to and you knew there was going to be consequences. You know, why, you know why the average person gets fearful when people start talking about the rapture? Because they haven't done the chores that their Heavenly Father has told them to do prior to Daddy coming back to the house. Amen? It ought not to scare you for a preacher to preach about the rapture. It ought not to scare you. 
It ought not to worry you that the Bible says that one of these days, when you don't have a clue, the trump of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. It ought not to bother you about that. You ought to say like the Apostle Paul said, even so, come Lord Jesus right now. But if you tarry, we have a responsibility. We have a job. I'm glad that I know that this is not my final abode. This is not the final chapter. I'm glad this is just a dress rehearsal of what eternity is going to be like. But I had a, I love to sing songs. I love to be in the house of God. I love to be around the people of God. But friend, we have to understand that this is just a, a warm up for what heaven's going to be. This is just a warm up for what we get to see. I love to go and look out the outside world. I love to see all the handiwork that God's created on this planet that is absolutely gorgeous. I don't think there could be any uh, a beautiful, uh, more beautiful place than to drive through the Appalachia Mountains, amen, to see them Blue Ridge, to, to wake up and just uh, feel the crispness of that air. I, I think a sunset on a Florida beach is absolutely beautiful. I've got to see uh, the Rocky Mountains. I've got to see the dry places in Texas. I've got to be in Romania. I've seen some of the beautiful uh, landscape there and uh, even down in South America and in Central America. I've seen the beautiful handiwork of God. But friend, don't you understand that all this pales in the comparison of what he's created for us and what waits for us. At that moment when the trump of God shall sound, all this that used to bother us is now gone, is now departed, and now we step into a different world and a different realm that God has for each and every one of you. We, we ought to be the world's happiest people. I mean, we ought to have a smile permanently affixed on our face. You, you, ever, you ever smiled because you knew how a story ended? Like, you ever had somebody think they were getting over on you? You're like, yeah, man, go ahead. I got you. I like it when I can catch my kids in something, amen? And I already know what it was, and you just start setting them up for the fall. And they just keep, keep going down the road. Corner. You know, do you know when all the wicked stuff happens in your life and people want to come up against you, you ought to put a permanently a fixed grin on your face because you already know how that story ends? Friend, if you're a born-again child of God, you win. Amen. The old song you say, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. We are on the winning side today. You don't have anything to fret about. You don't have anything to worry about. We have to have an understanding that the Bible already tells us about what waits for us. There is no mystery. One of these days, the trump of God will sound. You say, what does that sound like? I don't have a clue. I've heard preachers blow a shafar like a ram's horn. Say, it's going to sound like this. I don't know. I, I like to kind of think the biblical aspect is what happens in Revelation chapter 4. Notice what happens here. Here in the Bible, it says, John said, And I heard, as it were, uh, uh, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Well, I like that. I like that. And we all sit around wondering what that horn's going to sound like. Are we going to be driving all of a sudden here? Burr, burr. I don't have a clue. I kind of like to think that what I'm seeing here and what I read in the Old Testament in a, in a book that many of us wonder why is even in the Bible. You see, in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon is a, is a story between two people who are in love but are not together. And they're describing each other. And it says that that shepherd looks at that little Shulamite girl and, she said, and he says this, come up. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the days are far gone. I'd like to think that our Lord and Savior will look at his bride, the bride of Christ, and says, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. You fought a good fight. You finished your course, and you have kept the faith. But I, I, I would like to think that there's some massive trumpet that's going to sound, but I'm thinking that it's going to be more like a still, small voice that says, Come up hither. Let me show you what I've prepared for you. Amen. God does a lot of things in a big and boisterous way. But I know when the prophet was there, he said, I didn't hear God in the fire. I didn't hear God in the whirlwind. I didn't hear God in the earthquake. I heard him in that still, small voice. And friend, let me tell you, there's been more times in your life that God didn't show up in a, in, in a firestorm or in a hailstorm or in an earthquake. But in those still moments of your life when you thought nobody else cares, and when that still, small voice whispered, says, I'm still here. Do not fear. 
We, we're more familiar with the still, small voice than we are the earthquakes and the firestorms. Amen. Yeah. He talks about that time when the saints of God will be gathered together and what a celebration it'll be. Friend, I can't describe to you enough the future events of that rapture when the redemption is complete and all those saints of God are now coming together in that place. No wonder, no wonder the book of Revelation ends with that so come quickly, even Lord Jesus. Amen. You see, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh. What a celebration it'll be. What a welcoming it'll be in heaven when all God's people get there. I, I, I would like to know, I'd like to be able to describe exactly what it is, but all I can do is give what the Bible says. And the Bible says when that shout happens, there will, there will be a, a, a state of worship that we've never seen before. Continue reading with me in the book of Revelations. In, <laughs> the Bible says in verses 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. You say, who are these four and twenty elders? I don't know, I don't care, but they all right, all right? Amen. They in heaven, I'm going to be in heaven, we all right. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. If you don't know what that is all about, you've got to go to Revelation chapter 1, and you can tell all about that. Revelation chapter 1 through 3 will tell you all about those seven lamps, the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts uh, had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne who liveth forever and ever. And the, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. To get a little further glimpse, go over into chapter 5, and the Bible says... And I beheld, in verse 11, and I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and uh, such as are in the sea. And all that, there are, all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Friend, we always think about the celebration that will happen in heaven. And we, we always think about that time that we'll get there and, and we'll see our loved ones. And we'll see uh, the streets of gold and the walls of jasper. Friend, let me tell you, all those things are there. But the most spectacular event that will happen in heaven is the opportunity we'll have to worship our Lord and Savior, to worship our God, our Father, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, with no restrictions of the flesh, with no restrictions of humanity, with no restrictions at all, face to face with pure love, face to face with pure holiness, to see the angels of God described in Isaiah with two with six wings, two covering their face, two covering their feet, and two their flesh and continually they're crying out like all creation cries out holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty aren't you glad you serve a holy God Amen. it would do us no good to serve something that was flawed I like to joke around a lot about Chevy's versus Ford's but friend I'm going to tell you at the end of the day all of them fail Amen? All of them fail. Fords more often than Chevys, but all of them fail. Amen? We Southerners are proud of all kind of, we're, we're, we're proud of our cuisine, but friend, let me tell you, 
There's good eatings all over the world. Amen. Friend, we, we sometimes, we, 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 we don't realize what it means to have a holy God that we serve without flaws. Friend, I love southern cuisine, but friend, let me tell you, I've tasted some bad southern cuisine. Southern cuisine is flawed. You say, what's flawed about southern cuisine? Some of y'all are mad right now. You say, what are you talking about, brother Aaron? Ain't nothing wrong with how us, how us Southerners eat. There ain't a thing wrong with how us Southerners eat, amen? <laughs> the problem of it is flawed because we eat too much stuff we ought not to eat, amen? <laughs> gravy is good, amen? amen? But gravy three times a day on everything you eat is ain't good for you, amen? It's flawed, friend, it's flawed. <laughs> good old, good old... Coconut cream pie is wonderful, amen? amen? But not the whole pie. <laughs> you see, everything we see in this life is flawed. The concept of having something that is perfect is such a foreign concept because we've never seen anything perfect. I was talking about those beautiful places you can go and see in the world, but you realize how dangerous some of the most beautiful places in the world are some of the most dangerous places in the world. Why? Flaws. Flaws. We all have them. You, you know what causes us more grief in our life? Not our successes. I, I, I don't understand why, why we, don't, we don't focus in on some of the good we do and forget about all the bad we've done. It is so, you, you see how easy it is to, to bring up somebody's negative things versus somebody's positive things? Man. It's easy for me to talk about all the things that are wrong. You know why? Because none of us in here have ever seen perfection in its entirety. Man. Do you know it's hard for us to worship because sometimes there's things that happen around us even while we're worshiping that draw our attention off of the perfection of worship to our Heavenly Father? You ever been praying and all of a sudden the most craziest thoughts run through your head? I mean, you'd be locked in. I mean, you'd be at the, the, you'd just be grabbing the horns of the altar saying, dear God, you know, just do this, do this. Next thing you know, I got to get blades for the lawnmower. Where'd that come from? Amen. And you're like, Obviously, you try to be super spiritual. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. I got to get blades for the lawnmower, but I want you to help in this situation in my life. And next thing you know, everything it's thought. You know why? Because we're flawed. And, and even in church, you ever, you, you, you ever been in a good church service? And, you, and you'll just be going along at it, and then something draw your attention off of what the purity and the holiness of that is? In that moment? Why? Because we're flawed. Because we're distracted by things that the lust pulls, the flesh pulls, that the nature pulls away our attention from the Father. In heaven, no distractions. No distractions. I was telling somebody the other day, uh, you know, some of y'all might know this, a lot of y'all know this, some of y'all might not know, but I have a, a side business where I, I cut meat. And so... I have a walk-in cooler where I go in and, I, and, and we process all the meat that, bring, that, that farmers bring to us. We, we, we process it out. I was telling somebody the other day, that, that cooler sometimes is like a, a time capsule. You say, what? Because there is no windows. There is no outside light that gets in it. We can walk in that cooler sometimes and close the door and completely lose track of the day and how it goes. There have been times I've walked in there and when I walked out, it's dark out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's dark. Why? Because that room blocks out every distraction. You, you, ever, you, ever, found yourself, you ever found yourself eating based on when you, when you see light outside and when you don't see light outside? And you say this comment, well, it's dark, we've got to have time for supper. Whether you're hungry or not. Why? We're, we're so governed by the things, the environments of our life. And so therefore, we control our lives by time. I'm, I'm telling you, sometimes I'd walk in that cooler. I can walk in that cooler and completely lose track of time. Why? Distractions are gone. You know the beauty of heaven is? There is no sun. You say, well, wait, wait a minute. Uh, who cares about that? The Lamb of God is our light. No, friend. There's no distractions of saying, well, this day is over. 
There's no distractions of time. There's no distractions of matter either. There's no things that are in heaven that we need. God provides it all. You know, we get caught up on the, the walls of Jasper and we get caught up on the mansions that God is going to build. Friend, I've never found in the scriptures where we live in those mansions. I know we have a lot of good songs. I got a mansion just over the hilltop. We don't find that. The Bible says in my father's house are many mansions. If, I were, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prayer, prayer place for you. And if I go to prayer place, you say, well, it's given. It's understood that God gives us a mansion. Now we're in the Bible say God gives us a mansion. Why? What do we need a house for in heaven? Ooh, think about that one for just a little second. We have a new glorified body that never tires, slumbers, or sleeps. There is no night. What do we need a house for? He said, well, why God's building it? For somebody else later down the road, which you'd have to do a lot of study to understand that one day heaven's going to be on earth and there's people going to come and go and come and go and buy and say and trail and say, but that's not us because we're ruling and reigning with Christ because we've been given a new glorified body. So stop listening to songs and read your Bible because outside influences don't affect us. Why? Because we're so governed by those things today. And it's those things which rob us of true worship. You know, true worship is when we set aside everything. I, I've given this description. Worship always carries the idea of sacrifice. Amen. It always carries the idea of sacrifice. For you to worship in the Old Testament period, for them to worship, they had to sacrifice. A lamb was sacrificed. Well, guess what? We're in the New Testament period now. We don't have to sacrifice anything anymore because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, came and died. And by one man's sacrifice, we all have salvation. Amen. So what is worship to us, the New Testament Christian? Here is the great sacrifice of your life, that nothing else matters in life but him. Amen. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not, con uh, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are able to give that great sacrifice to God because we are able to say nothing else matters. I shut it all out. I walk into that cooler. I shut the door and nothing else matters but me and God. Amen. It is impossible for us to have that here on earth but one day <laughs> one day there will be no son who governs our day Thank you, one day there will be no body that governs the matter of our life and friend with a complete holiness with a complete environmental holiness we can look at our god our father and say holy 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 is the lord god almighty and the Bible says, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. And at that moment, we'll be in that great celebration with him. We see the great welcome we have. We see the great worship. But I see something that happens here that is interesting. The Bible said there's a, there's a conflict that happens in heaven. There's a conflict that happens in heaven that is kind of intriguing to me at, at the very beginning because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 that something happens. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And notice this. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book therein to look thereon. And John said, and I wept much. I wept much. Why? Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book therein to look thereon. Some might say, well, what is this book? What, what is this all about, friend? This is exactly what every one of us longs for that is the scroll of redemption Amen. you see god gave this world to mankind and mankind gave it away with one desire of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil we might say with one bite of the apple but it was no apple it was no bite it was the desire for something that god said you do not need because you have me and this whole world and all of humanity fell into a curse. 
And everybody in this room is affected by that curse. It's called sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We like to talk about death as that second nature, but friend, death affects us all. Do you realize that we all get old because of sin? We all get old because of sin. Some of us get older faster because of sin. It's interesting that the Bible says the best thing you can do for your health is to honor your father and mother and to be health to your navel. Why? You live right, you act right, blessings will be on your life, amen? Amen. But what a disgrace and how quickly life is sucked from you when we decide to live riotous living. And the Bible says that earth was cursed, humanity plunged, and we all have sin. Until one day in heaven, there will come a time when he will pay for all of it. And he is the only one worthy to open up that seal. He is our kinsman redeemer. And the Bible says, and lo, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. (laughs) Well, I like that. Stood a lamb. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book, and out of the, uh, out of the right hand of him that sat upon it. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden, uh, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. They sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, out of every tongue, people, and nation. And God has made us unto, uh, and, and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You see, the great object of that worship is to understand what God has done in my life. He has redeemed me. That's a big word, isn't it? Amen. Many of you Christians have used that word redemption. But you don't live every day like you understand what redemption means. What does it mean to be redeemed? You say, I'm a child of God. Exactly right. So what does it mean to be redeemed? My sins have been forgiven. You're exactly right. What does it mean to be redeemed? That, that, that I'm a new creature in Christ. You're exactly right. But we don't put all those things together to make it change how we live today. Right. I've given this illustration. I'll give it again and I'll give the example behind it. That word redemption comes with three parts in it, three understandings, agarasso, exagarasso, and latus. Three parts of the same word that give a full definition of what that word means. Agarasso means that God saw me how I was. He saw me how I was. The prophet said this, he saw me in the pollution of my day. And the wickedness of my day. Friend, let me tell you right now, you can try to clean up the best you can, but you know who you are. Amen. You know what you've done when nobody else was around. You know what you've done when nobody else has seen it. Yes. You know who you are. More you can hide, you can, you can make believe, you can come to church and everybody in the church think you're a child of God and a saint of God, but there's somebody who knows you, somebody who sees you. But the Bible says he just doesn't see me, but he sees me with compassion. He doesn't see me with judgment, but he sees me with love. It'd be almost like if someone sees something that says, I want that. You you ever been somewhere in life and you saw something and immediately you said, I I want to get that because I want to restore it. Or I want to get that so I can do something with it. Brother Don works wonderfully with wood. He would look at wood differently than I would. I would look at it and say, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a piece of wood. Let's just throw it on the fire. He would say, wait a minute. That's, that's a piece of cherry wood. Do you know what we can do with this? You see, his vision of what that garbage is is differently because he loves what he does. God looks at you and you think, God, I'm nothing. But God says, wait a minute. I see the potential of who you are. Because I see the worth of who you are. Friend, 
If there's anything that I want to tell you today, God sees your worth in spite of what your guilt tells you you are. Agarasso, he sees you. Exagarasso, he says this. Not only do I see you and do I have compassion, but I see you and have compassion enough to say I don't want you to stay where you are at. You, you ever seen something and you knew the value, but you knew where it was, the value wasn't going to be appreciated as much? The other day, I did my yearly job of cleaning out my truck. If you've ever ridden with me, you know the joy of that whole experience. As I was cleaning out, I ran across some change that had fallen in the floor. Brother Don is dying right now. I seen some change that had fallen on the floor, on the floorboard that I didn't know. It was right there on the bus seat. And I, oh, oh, look, a couple of quarters. Well, I picked up like $8 worth of quarters at the end of that whole experience, man. And, and, and this is what went through my head. The value of what it was was lost because of the position it was at. Amen. Friend, many of us don't realize the value of who you are because you're in the wrong place of life. Yes. Exagerasso says this, God not only sees you, but he understands the worth of you, and he says, I need to take you somewhere else so that your value is seen by all. And the last word of redemption means latus. Agarasso means he saw me and he loved me. Exagarasso says he saw me and loved me enough to take me out. Latus means when he took me out of the current situation, he set me free to do what I was supposed to do, what I was created to do. He gave me freedom to live and to love. Many years ago in the early times of our nation's history, there was a blight upon our land where we sold and bought people called slavery. There was a lot of big movements in our nation. Some of the big slave markets up north, even slave markets down south, there were people who fought against it. the whole abolitionist movement, dominated p political parties, either you was for slavery or against slavery, but it was a big movement in the early colonial times in the United States. Eventually, some historians say it even led to a civil war as there was great division about what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. But early in that colonial times, the story was told of a, a minister in the New England states who was very much for the abolitionist movement, be, be, believed that all men were created by God and all men had the opportunity to be free. Did not believe you ought to purchase somebody in that fashion and he would preach it from his pulpit, but just being a meager pastor, didn't do, have a lot of political clout, didn't have a lot of wealth to change the society and his community. But one day, he was so aggravated, and he was walking in the, the streets there, and he heard an auction going on, a human auction, a slave auction. Found his way meandering to that place in that area. Very aggravated, and what he saw even disturbed him more. There was a young lady there on the auction block. He knew this was not going to end well. They began to bid, and the bid kept going higher and higher, and then it kind of plateaued. Those wishing to gain more profit did something despicable and stripped her clothes off of her. And began, immediately the price began to jump as the lust of men began to jump. And this young lady stood there being an object preacher just enraged mad and aggravated began to bid he didn't care what the cost was he was just going to bid he was he was going to bid he he knew what was going on was wrong he knew the fate of that young lady was going to be just absolutely devastating he began to bid and he kept bidding and people began to look people began to mock what is this preacher bidding on this girl for oh yeah we thought you were a minister what are you doing Finally, when it was all said and done, he had had the highest bid and they struck the gavel. The preacher, being moved by what had happened, took his coat off and, and came to the young lady and put it around her. Escorted her out of that wicked place and with paperwork in hand of her freedom. He began to explain to the young lady, you're free now. You're free you don't have to worry about this anymore. These papers in your hand give you the freedom. You can go anywhere. 
These papers have liberated you. No one can ever own you again. You're free. He went back to his house and told his wife what had happened. He said, I've spent more money than what we really could afford, but I was just moved. At night, they went to bed like normal. The next day, wife got up preparing the normal day and she went outside and there was somebody laying on her front porch. She ran back inside and says, Hun, there's, there's somebody on the porch. The guy walked out and to his amazement, it was the young lady that he had just helped the day before. He said, what are you doing here? You're free. I, I didn't buy you to be here at my house. I, you don't owe me anything. I, I set you free. You can do anything you want to do in life. You're free. The young lady looked at him and in her broken English said, anyone who would pay for me to be free deserves my love and attention forever. The story is told as she gratefully served that man and that woman for the rest of her life because she was so grateful for the price that was paid for her freedom. Why do we find it so hard to serve a loving father that gave so much for you? One day I will enjoy everything that John describes in that chapter. Do you realize that John is getting a vision of our future? Notice what I said. John is getting a vision of our future. I started this message saying that chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 describes an event called the rapture. I believe with all my heart that one day there'll be a rapture and I'll be caught up and all this will be gone. And I will find myself around the throne of God as that seal is broken and my redemption becomes fully paid. No more sin, no more death, no more sorrow. Friend, I am thoroughly convinced that when we read Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, he is describing an event that I will be standing around one day. Amen. Do you realize if the rapture took place and you're a child of God and we're around the throne of God, that the events that are described in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, you're standing around the throne of God when they take place? This is the thought that blew my mind. Absolutely just blew my mind. John got a vision of me praising my heavenly father around the throne. <laughs> Somewhere I'd like for him to say, and by the way, Aaron, you're kind of standing to the right, right next to Gabriel. Don't worry. Give me an insight. Where am I going to be? How close am I going to be to the action? Am I going to be stuck in the back? I'll sing real loud. If I, care. I don't care, but... John's describing us redeemed. We're going to sing that song. We're going to bow down. We're going to worship him. We're going to be in heaven when those four and 20 elders cast their crowns before the. We're going to be in heaven when Jesus Christ steps forth and said, I've paid the price and I'm going to open that seal. We're going to be in heaven when all this stuff transpires. We're going to be in heaven around the throne of God. We're going to be in that vision that John saw. Thank you, Father. I'm going to be there. But here's a thought that runs through my head. I know beyond a shadow of my doubt what happened July the 5th, 1990, I got saved. And because of the events of that day, my life has been forever changed. I'm going to be in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. But because God's given me a purpose and a mission here, my question to you today is this. Did John see you standing there? I know he sees me there. I know I'm going to be there. But my mission in life is to ask you this question. Did John see you that day when he got that vision, worshiping around the throne? Because you have made that decision to follow God. Or are you here today not certain if you'll be in that great picture? Heaven is real. Redemption is sure. And the word of God is promised. 
The only thing for you today is to decide, have I followed him and trusted him? And answer this question with the affirmity of your heart. Does John see you in that vision? With every head bowed, every eye closed. A few years back, a songwriter wrote a song. And the first verse of that song says, I dreamed of a city called glory so bright and so fair as I entered the gates I cried holy, the angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion, and all oh, the sights I saw, but I said, I want to see Jesus who bled and died for all. I wonder today, would that song become a reality to you because you're a child of God? There are many people who understand about heaven. There's many people who know the story. But I'm afraid there's going to be many who never experienced that scene. Because here, when they had the opportunity, they didn't accept him as their personal savior. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm not talking about being a good person. I'm not talking about going through life, doing all the right things. I'm talking about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a pastor. I'm not going to heaven because of where I was born. I'm not going to heaven because of which side of the tracks I was born on. I'm going to heaven because July the 5th, 1990, I knelt down on an altar and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all my sin, and to be my Lord and Savior. It came a personal time in my life that I accepted Him. And friend, I will be at that vision of John when all of those things transpire, when the worshiping and the welcoming and the great uh, redemption of all mankind becomes a reality. I will be there because of my personal relationship with my heavenly father. But friend, my question today is, do you know him? The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Today is the opportunity God's given you. As a child of God, here is the encouragement for you. Yes, we face tough times. Yes, we face difficulties, but there will come a day and time when I bow on my knees and cry holy. If I already know the realization of that moment, then why don't I live my life doing that here? He's a holy God, and he's never left you nor forsaken you. If you're a child of God here today and you're going through some difficult times, maybe the answer for your difficult times is to bow on your knees and just say, you're a holy God, and I worship you. Nothing else matters. But there might be somebody here today that does not know him. That's not 100% sure. Maybe today is the day you get that thing settled. Maybe today is the day you just come to terms between you and your Heavenly Father. Maybe today is the day that you finally just give up. Stop fighting. Find that rest. Find that peace. Find the relationship with Him. Miss Patty's playing a hymn of invitation. In just a moment, we will have what we call an invitation where I, I will invite you to do business with God. Here, here's my invitation. Christian, 
I know things are tough. I know things are difficult. I know some of you are going through some major, major battles in your life. Times of indecision, times of questioning, times of you're not sure what to do. You need to stop looking for the answer and rest upon the rock. Stop looking for security and know that you're already safe. Stop looking for other things and just look to Him, the author and finisher of your faith. Maybe today you get back to the simplicity of your relationship with Him and just get on your face and say, you are holy, you are holy, you are holy, and nothing else matters. But maybe you're here today, you don't know Him as your personal Savior. Maybe today you have questions. Today is the day. Today is is that moment. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a bold and courageous step. Meet me down front. Let me show you from the Bible how you can know 100% sure that you're saved. I'm going to pray pray for you in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to take that first great acknowledgement if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you have questions about that in your life if you don't know a 100% sure I want you to be courageous with something you say brother Aaron that's me I don't know that I'm saved but I sure don't want to go to heaven I sure don't want to go not be ready when heaven is called. So Brother Aaron, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to know. Pray for me. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm going to ask you to do one simple act. No one's looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you say, Brother Aaron, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I just want you to simply just raise your hand and put it back down. That's it. One simple step. Brother Aaron, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't know that I'll be there. What John saw. Raise it up. Put it right back down. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. Christian, some of you are struggling. I'm going to ask you to be courageous this morning. I'm going to ask you to lead the way. Some of us need to get back to worshiping him for who he is. You know the price that was paid for you. You know the redemption that you enjoy. Some of us need to get back to just falling on our face and say, you are a holy God and I trust you. This invitation is for you, my friend. Now is the time. Come back. Come back to a place where we just worship him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I thank you for the realness of the Scriptures, Lord. Lord, in the reality that one day all the events that we read, Lord, will come into play. My mind is just blown away to know that John saw the events where I'll be standing one day. That John saw the events that I'll be around the throne of God. That the events that John described that one day, God, I'll see them in person and Lord understanding that it it frightens me to know that some people I know won't be there because they've not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ what it it frightens me Lord I pray today if there's one of those friends that are in this auditorium or listening online, that today, God, they'll accept you. They'll pray and ask Christ into their heart. And today, God, they'll get that settled. Give them the strength. Lord, some have raised their hand. Lord, with the acknowledgement of that hand raised, God, they're, they're saying, I'm not sure that I'm saved. God, bless them and help them. Give them strength. Lord, there are some Christians in here struggling today, God. They're so focused on what they see here and law, have lost sight of what is waiting for them. Lord, help them today to come to a place in their life where they just bow and acknowledge the holiness of God in their life. Give us strength today as we move forward for you. In Christ's name we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's stand to our feet. Maybe you're here today. 
with no one looking around, let's stand to our feet. Maybe you're here today and as a child of God, you know that you're saved. You know that heaven is your home, but you're struggling with some stuff. Christian, I'm going to ask you to take that first step. You're here today and you know that you're, you're a born again child of God. But man, there's some things that have been going on in your life that you've lost. You lost perspective of that true worship of Him. Maybe as a child of God, you come to this place in your life where you simply say, Lord, I want to bow on my face and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The acknowledgement of God in your life, working in your life, the acknowledgement of God doing something great that you just surrender and say, Lord, I trust you with my life. Maybe today this is your time. Christians have come. But I wonder today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you take that moment to come meet me down front? Would you take that opportunity this morning to take a step so that you know, that you see, that you understand what God has done in your life? I wonder today, would you take that step to accepting Christ your personal Savior? We're going to sing this song together as she plays it. I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. I wonder, friend, today, is that you? Have you come to the place where you could bow on your face and say, Lord, you are the Holy One of Israel in my life? I wonder today, are you at peace? Sing with me. I dream of a city called glory so bright and so fair as i entered the gates of that city the angels all met me there they carried me from mansion to mansion and all oh, the sights I saw but I said I want to see Jesus the one who died for all then I bowed on cried holy 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 I clapped my hands and sang glory glory to the Son of God amen thank you so much I wonder today if we could be encouraged by one thing, to take the message that God has for us of the truth of our future, if we would take that message and make it a part of how we react in life, one of these days we'll have the opportunity. One of these days we'll have the blessed joy of not having any of the problems we have today. I wonder if we would be willing to take that thought into our tomorrow. You're going to face some trials. I wish I could tell you today that tomorrow is going to be just peachy keen. I wish I could tell you that tomorrow everything is going to go as planned. I'd be lying to you if that was the case. Most of you are going to go out of this room and something difficult is going to happen. But one thing is always sure. I serve a holy God, Amen. and His plan is perfect, and His plan is sure. And I know that He has a perfect plan for me. He is the author and finisher of my faith, and what a beautiful thing is to live out the story He scripted for me. Now this week, we've got a job. You say, what is it? Well, here's my job. Here's your job. If you know that you're saved, you know you're going to be in that story, amen? amen? 
Let me ask you this. Let me, let me put it this way. How many of you say, Brother Aaron, when you were reading about John and all them people around the throne, I was there. I know I'm there. I know I'm there because that's what John records. And if John records, I'm there. Now let me ask you this. Here's our job this week. Who are you going to take with you? Who are you going to take with you? Who do you want standing beside you when that moment happens? If John saw you, and by your acknowledgement of being in, in that crowd, that means you're a born-again child of God. So my question is this. Who is going with you? Let's make that opportunity available for everybody. Amen? Yes. Amen. Have a seat real quickly. Brother Jimmy um, asked me, he called me last week, and this is not the first deacon who's made this statement to me. Uh, about the gratefulness of Miss Mary Maryfield in our office. Miss Mary does everything. Turn off the camera if you want, mine. The gratefulness of Miss Mary Maryfield in our office. She does everything volunteer base um, from the time that we were in great need, uh, the time that. Uh,